From the basement, where Weekend Filler is disguised as a tribute to the 40th anniversary of Late Night with David Letterman coming up on February 1st, it's Daily Comedy News. Hi, I'm Johnny Mack. The Washington Post wrote a lengthy piece with David Letterman in 2017. Harry Joseph Letterman, his father, introduced Dave to Jack Benny's radio show. He also introduced Dave to the concept of the tortured performer. Harry owned a flower shop, and to this day, David Letterman isn't sure why his father seemed happiest when he was playing organ, which he could do for hours, or putting on an impromptu show, even at church functions. Dave said his father would throw in jokes, he'd have props, he would turn something dull into something silly— while he liked flowers and liked growing them and arranging them, it's not where he wanted to be. The Post writes, What set Letterman apart, as much as his material, was his persona. He was a fidgety, self-depreciating figure, either so pleased or so disturbed when a joke failed that he would remind viewers of the biggest bombs by calling them back throughout the show. Paul Schaefer said, If we were analysts, we can analyze him. He wouldn't even have to lie down on the couch. And he loved having a show like that. And he liked real conversation, even between me and him. He never wanted to plan what we were going to say, and it made for a real what-you-see-is-what-you-get kind of experience. Eventually, Letterman would define himself as a performer, but on his own terms. There were bits clearly borrowed from Steve Allen, the former Tonight Show host and one of his heroes, but there would be nothing approximating Johnny Carson's Karnak the Magnificent on Late Night. Instead, David Letterman would crack jokes while working the drive through at a McDonald's or haul a crew to a Sears in Hicksville, New York, to confront a viewer named Colleen Boyle, who had criticized him in a viewer mail segment for wearing sneakers. The New Yorker wrote about Dave, and I think they really captured where I was. I was probably the same age as the writer, who says, Back when I was 16, trapped in the snoozy early 80s and desperate for something rude and wild, David Letterman seemed like an anarchist. His manner suggested that TV could puncture the culture rather than prop it up. My friends, particularly the guys, became his acolytes, quoting his catchphrases, and my group did this as well, this exact same phrase, they pelted us with rocks and garbage copying Dave's deadpan effect, all of us imprinted like ducklings on his persona, the nice guy with the mean streak, making the world safe for smart comedy. The truth is, the show Letterman oversaw in those early years was a far lighter, freer, more strange and cerebral and surreal project than it eventually became. It began as the brainchild of Dave and his girlfriend at the time, Meryl Marco, who was the show's first head writer. She invented one-offs like dog poetry and perennial segments like stupid pet tricks. They had considered doing stupid baby tricks, but worried about the legal implications. In 1980, pulling from earlier experimentalists like Ernie Kovacs and Steve Allen, they built a daytime talk show on NBC full of oddball pranks, which bored housewives, but won over college kids. When it flopped, the network was eager to keep Dave on the schedule, so got rid of Tom Snyder. Late night was on at 12.30 a.m. This was before TiVo and Hulu, when you actually had to stay up late to catch the funky stuff. Within two years, Dave was a hero to wise acres everywhere. On the surface... The early Letterman resembled his mentor, the icy superstar Johnny Carson. He was apolitical, he was Midwestern, he had a repressive manner and lanky college boy looks, but he vibrated with a contradictory charisma. He had a discomfort with back padding and schmoozing, an odd characteristic for a man whose longtime dream job was TV host. The early late night included stars, but they were never the point. The charge came from the bits, the remotes, the pranks, a circus of eccentricity, from monkey cam to Chris Elliott climbing out from beneath the bleachers. Regulars included Larry Bud Melman, an elderly character actor who was both mocked and adored. Over the decades, through the bruising late-night wars with Jay Leno, past a sex scandal handled with refreshing bluntness and a heart attack, and into his late curmudgeon era on CBS, Letterman occasionally seemed at risk of dissolving, Cheshire Cat style, into his green glasses and cigar, his influence spread so wide that his innovations became cliches. I've talked about this on this podcast before. I loved NBC Letterman and like the first year of CBS Letterman, and then I just stopped watching, and this was something I loved. It kind of reminds me of Howard Stern. I used to hang on every word Howard Stern says. I have zero interest at all in the 2022 version of Howard Stern. CBS Letterman, I always sum it up. 12.30 Dave wore sneakers, 11.30 Dave wore Armani and shoes. And so we come to the end, UPI, January 14th, 1993. David Letterman has accepted a multi-million dollar deal to move his late night talk show to CBS in August after his contract with NBC runs out. 
Howard Stringer, president of the CBS Broadcast Group, said Letterman's show will premiere on CBS in an 1130 Monday through Friday time slot, going head to head with Jay Leno on NBC's Tonight Show, ABC's Nightline and Paramount's syndicated Arsenio Hall show. Stringer said the time period should have belonged to Dave a long time ago, and now it will. He's smart, he's thoughtful, he's original, he's daring, and he's fun. We are delighted to welcome Dave and his very talented team to the CBS family. At the press conference, a cigar-chomping letterman said, As some of you may know, for the last year and a half, I've been kind of interested in doing a show a little earlier than the one I'm doing now. The reality has come to pass, but what ultimately makes me happy and satisfied is I get to come here and do it at CBS. At a taping of his Thursday show in New York, David Letterman told his audience that his last day at NBC would be June 25th and quipped, Don't mind me, I'm just a temp. Reports are Letterman will make between 14 and $16 million a year. A Letterman would not disclose, but said it's enough to buy a pack of gum. The deal certainly would have put a smile on Jack Benny's face. Even the condition he's in now, he would have found some reason to smile. Earlier in the day, NBC had their own press conference. Jay Leno rode up to the podium on a motorcycle and said, I have the job. What we're celebrating here is that I haven't been fired. Leno at that time said he remained friends with Letterman during the negotiations, saying, Throughout these negotiations, it has not been a case of somebody trying to screw somebody else. It was a matter of, hey, it's an important job and everybody would like to have it. Littlefield said NBC would replace Letterman in the 12.30 slot with a show from the producers of Saturday Night Live. Speculation is Dana Carvey will take over the 12.30 slot replacing Letterman. Other candidates, Dennis Miller and Bob Costas. No mention of Conan O'Brien. In that same 2017 Washington Post article I opened up with, they asked Dave, do you miss hosting late night? And he said, not for a second. That's your comedy news for today. Follow the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your shows. See you tomorrow.